Hi everyone, Hungry Reader here. Just getting set up for a quiet Halloween at home. You know, for two or three years now, ever since I got too old to trick or treat, I've tried to enjoy Halloween my own way. Not only by making it a welcome atmosphere for the kids, but by enjoying my own favorite classic books from my childhood. Like, oh, you've got The Candy Witch, and, uh, ooh, here we have uh, Witch Witch's Witch, and, ooh, let's not forget, Son of a Witch. Real Halloween classic for all generations. But it's not Halloween if you don't decorate, so I try to get the house into spooktacular shape with Make and Color Your Own Halloween Decorations. Now, I've always thought of this book as being the generic Halloween book. It's not an insult. You see those white on black letters on the title, and you see how on the inside the titles are all strangely lowercase? It reminded me of the generic products you could buy from Ralph's grocery stores in the 80s, as seen on this episode of Roseanne. Now here's the laziest page in the whole book. Color these pumpkins and cut them out. You know, pumpkins are not that hard to draw. If your kid can't draw a pumpkin, I wouldn't give them a pair of scissors. Now I think this is much more representative of the style the artist usually took. Cute little animals dressed up for Halloween and... What the hell is that thing? So I'm making decorations, I'm keeping up with my classics, and I'm making an internet video, so I got a pretty full Halloween week. But there's one thing that some people do at Halloween that I never do. I don't watch scary movies. Ever. Not anymore. Not since I read the 2,000 pound goldfish. Hey kids, it's me, your spooky pal, Infuriatio F. Punch Magnet! We've got a spooktacular movie for you tonight! It'll drive you batty! Awoo! Tonight's movie is called The 2,000 Pound Goldfish! A tale of thrills, chills, and gills that we fished for you right out of the Erie Canal! <laughs> so have a sheet! and enjoy the show! Ow! The 2,000 Pound Goldfish by Betsy Biars. 2,000 pounds? Poor goldfish. I'll bet at the end of the movie they have to knock out a wall to get the goldfish out of her apartment. Read and specially illustrated by the Hungry Reader. We've tried everything. Everything. Nothing can stop this monster. Wait, there's one thing we haven't tried. What? Of course. The SF-342 photoelectronic cloud. But I've never been tested. There's no guarantee it'll work. It's our one hope. Tell Dr. Baroni to ready his machine. But, Professor... A movie within a movie? Hebe jeebies I'd better go get some popcorn within some popcorn. Professor, look at the monster. It's still shrinking. The cloud works. This means... This means that if the cloud hits Los Angeles, it will reduce the entire population to the size of Barbie dolls within Warren ten minutes. Otis? Warren yeah. Otis? Is there a Warren Otis in the theater? Are you Warren Otis? Your grandmother called. You're supposed to go home. It's the early 80s. It's morning in America but the scars of Vietnam still sting across the country, most keenly for those who were too young to understand. Warren Otis is such a boy, and monster movies are his escape from a world that no one seems to have the patience to explain to him. <laughs> Sunglasses, huh? Kid, you won't think you're so cool when that goldfish gets you. Now, Warren doesn't just like watching monster movies, he wants to be a director. So as he trudges home early from another double feature once again, he starts thinking up a new movie, one starring 
a goldfish that his sister flushed down the toilet. What swims in the sewers below the city weighs 2,000 pounds and wants to slurp you to death. Warren broke off, frowning slightly. It was going to be hard to make Bubbles look scary. Oh! I guess the 2,000 pound goldfish is... The movie within the movie, which is a book and not a movie. Of course, Grandma doesn't care that she interrupted Warren's movie. She's calling him home for a very good reason, so he can go find his other sibling in her care, his sister Wheezy. Wheezy? Moving on up! Like on the Jeffersons! As he hunts for his sister, Warren's thoughts are consumed with his new goldfish, what if Wheezy was eaten by this 2,000-pound goldfish, swollen to an enormous size by experimental fertilizer? But when he does find her, it's even more startling. Wheezy's talking on a public phone and crying, and refuses to tell him what made her cry. But it doesn't take him long to figure it out. Wheezy was talking to their mother. Warren and Wheezy's mother, Saffron, Safi to her friends, is a member of a militant leftist organization, wanted in connection with bombings. Neither of them have seen her since Warren was five years old. Their grandmother has disowned her, but to Warren, his mother is a superhero who fights the injustice in this evil world. Yet he lives every day with the constant fear that he might pass his long-lost mother on the street and not recognize her. But Mom's biggest crime was in... Revealing the truth about the toxic fertilizer that makes killer goldfish. Right? The next day, Warren goes to visit his mother's sister, Aunt Pepper, who is usually his favorite person in the world because she's the only person he can share his movies with. But there's no time for that today. What Warren wants her to tell him is how Wheezy got in touch with their mother. Aunt Pepper informs him that their mother calls that payphone once a month. This starts a big fight between Warren and Wheezy as he asks why she never told him, but Wheezy bitterly informs him they've gotten five calls in three years. That night, Warren reads and rereads his mother's old postcards, wondering how his superhero mother could behave so callously toward her own children. Until Grandma comes in and angrily snatches the postcards away, making Warren so angry that he briefly threatens to hit her. But Grandma will not be bullied. Still angry the next day, Warren spends hours after school at Woolworths, which was sort of like Target in the 80s, watching the goldfish, building on his movie, and most importantly, avoiding home. I don't know why we have to spend a perfectly good Friday evening in the sewer. But sir, there was a young girl, a Louise Otis. How do you account for her disappearance? I... I don't know. Well, listen, I'm gonna be at a Boy Scout Jamboree in an hour. Why don't we split up? Let's meet back here in half an hour. The member of the committee in the Boy Scout uniform would get it first, Warren decided. The man was moving into the tunnel where Bubbles waited. And Bubbles was hungry. She hadn't eaten in three days. goldfish or not? It clearly shows on the cover the 2,000 pound goldfish of the title sneaking up on Wheezy and doing something with his fin through the phone booth. Is Warren just hallucinating this? It's not just Bubbles who's hungry. Warren hasn't had breakfast or lunch. After his vicious argument with Grandma last night, she didn't cook anything for him or Wheezy. Or at least that's what Warren thinks, until he comes home to a darkened apartment and realizes that overnight his grandmother has had a stroke. Quick, Wheezy! 
Go get George to walk on her back. Moving on up. At the hospital, Warren is consumed with guilt. Not just for not coming home in time to help Grandma sooner, but because he's not really that concerned about Grandma's welfare, he's excited that maybe this means Mom will come home. To take his mind off his guilty conscience, he tries making up another movie, one set in a hospital, where the steam pipes and the ceiling come alive. Pipe snakes! Hundreds of metallic bodies clattering around the concrete floors of the hospital, their iron and lead jaws chomping and ripping and tearing through everything in their path. He's so absorbed in his new movie that he barely notices Wheezy watching him and frowning. I can always tell when you're daydreaming because you have a sort of out-of-it look on your face. It's like you're on drugs or something. A little daydreaming is fine, Warren. It's like a little food or a little wine. Only when it becomes the most important thing you do when you gorge yourself on food. There's a girl in my school who freaks out on food and she's bigger than someone in a sideshow. She's carried eating so far that she can't even live a normal life. And you're carrying daydreaming too far. You're a daydream freak. You're not in the world 95% of the time. Nobody does anything by daydreaming about it. You don't see successful men sitting around looking like this. <sighs> Grandma's dead. You know... I'm starting to feel very misled here. It's called The 2,000 Pound Goldfish. At first I thought it was a horror movie, but it didn't look like one, so I thought, oh, maybe it's one of those old Disney movies, like The Cat from Outer Space or The Computer Who Wore Tennis Shoes. But it's not horror, and it's not Disney. It's just sorrow and dismal. 2,000 Pound Goldfish? What a... Bait and switch. <laughs> At his grandmother's funeral, Warren cries harder than anyone else, but not for his grandmother's sake. It's because the one thing that he thought would bring his mother back for sure this time didn't. But Aunt Pepper is their caretaker now, which means there are no more secrets. Which is why, when the first Monday of the month rolls around, Warren sneaks out behind Wheezy to try to catch his mother's phone call for the first time. Why are you pretending I don't know you're back there? You're about as subtle as a freight train, you know that? I wasn't gonna make you go home. I should have brought you a long time ago. So, come on, we'll miss the call if we're not right there at 7. If there is a call. I stood in that phone booth in a snowstorm for two hours last January. What do you plan to say? Well, first of all, I'm gonna have to tell her about Gr- And at this moment, Warren hears his mother's voice for the first time in seven years, but he barely gets to speak to her. When his mother learns of the death of her mother, she starts to cry and can't stop. Warren finally understands he can't keep waiting for his mother to come and rescue him, because she's so desperate for someone to come and rescue her. What about... Bubbles! Maybe I won't daydream so much. Maybe it's not good for me. Are you talking about your movies? You want me to listen? Well, this movie's about a 2,000 pound goldfish that's down in the sewer. It got so big because, uh... Suddenly it occurred to Warren that his movies were best when he wasn't sharing them. Things were popping in the sewer. A group of policemen had made their way inside. Bubbles sensed the sewer had been invaded. Suddenly, their way was blocked by a small boy. Warren did not usually take roles in his own movies, but this, his last, would be an exception, and this time he would be the hero. Now what's this all about, son? The goldfish is yours, you say? Yes, I'd know her anywhere! It's the eyes! Go ahead and cry, son. Here, this way, toward the camera. All the viewers are with you. They've all had goldfish. They know what it's like to flush one down the toilet. If there's anything that we could do to help... Well, there may be one thing. I think that if every person in this city flushed their toilets, she'd be washed out to sea. Or 
she could live out the rest of her life in peace and harmony. It might just work. Sam, get a camera up at the floodgates just in case. Folks, do you want to save this boy's 2,000 pound goldfish from being shot like a dog? So get into those bathrooms. Ready? On my signal. Three, two, one, flush! So tell folks how it feels to save the life of your own 2,000 pound goldfish. It feels great, and I'd really like to thank the thousands of people that helped. It was their flushing that saved Bubbles. Goodbye, Bubbles. Goodbye. Weezy, do you ever daydream? Sure. Well, what about? Well, I do not daydream about 2,000 pound goldfish. I used to dream about becoming a lawyer, and Mom would be on trial for something, and I'd get her off. Weezy, you're going to be a lawyer? You never told me that. He could see her in his mind at court, bigger than the judge, the opposing lawyers, her head sticking up like a mountain poking through clouds. He almost felt like an amateur. He watched his sister with sudden envy. Weezy, you're, you're going to be a lawyer. I know. Now will you come on? Well, maybe you will defend Mom someday. Maybe something will happen. She'll... Uh... That is my daydream. You make up your own. I did, but I'm finished now. What a spooky story! Full of angst and intrigue and other movies! That would have been a lot better for my show than this book was. Hey, guess who's here, everyone? It's my sidekick, beautiful big chested scream queen who never talks or enters the frame. We'll be wed soon. What do you have for me there, honey? Well, can you bring it on? Oh, silly me. You're a beautiful big chested scream queen who never talks around the frame. You never talk around the frame. I'll get it. Why, thanks, BBC SQWNTOETF. Look, everyone, it's the Mail Cauldron. And here to read our viewer mail is my chowdery chum, Scullivan! Oh, oh, it's right. I know you didn't in there. Oh, oh, here we go. Okay, our first letter today is a Halloween joke from Sam E. Terry, who writes, Dear Horatio Punch Target, what kind of vote does a vampire cast? That was phrased very awkwardly. Anyway, the answer is Sarah Pale In. Now, as always, if you get that joke, please explain it to Infuriatio at P.O. Box B O O O O Blubity Blue Whatever Rhode Island. I think that was the only one. Like, oh, we got another. Our next letter is from Halloween Pun, who writes, Dear Infuriatio F. Punch Magnet. You are kidding, right? Oh! Ha ha ha! That letter again! Just like last week! And the week before that! Maybe you're not getting it. Maybe I need to talk even slower? Maybe I need to put it up in the title. Inferior issue F Punch Magnet. He's not kidding. In answer to your question, Halloween pun, no. This is not satire. This is not parody. It's not supposed to be ironic. I worked very hard just convincing the station manager that the city needed a midnight horror host in the first place. I got the job! And I do not take my duties lightly. I'm Infuriatio F. Punch Magnet. I'm serious! <sighs> oh!
Oh, geez, I kind of got lost in my own memories there. <sighs> anyway, The 2000 Pound Goldfish is a book that I read years ago. It's about a kid who escapes from his everyday life by making up monster movies in his head. But the real takeaway for this book, for me at least, was this one scene. Suddenly, it occurred to Warren that his movies were best when he wasn't sharing them with another person. He couldn't bear looks of boredom. He didn't think he could stand to go into a theater full of people watching, say, Goldfish, and see them looking at his work of art as indifferently as Wheezy. It's that moment, right there. The moment when you realize that what you do, or are going to do, may not be what the world's been waiting for all this time. That's the moment that separates dreamers from doers. Now, Wheezy was just wrong. There are great people who just sit around zoned out, but they act on what they zone out about, and they are fully prepared to have their great masterpiece bore someone. You could spend years directing and filming a movie that's like your dreams laid out on the silver screen, but people will still just go and see something with celebrities instead. Or you could write a poem, decades in the making, all your most beautiful thoughts laid bare for the world to see, and you're gonna have to self-publish it. Or you could make up a wacky midnight movie host persona for your web show, but it's Halloween and everyone who's watching has already done the same on their own web shows. And that is the line in the sand. Are you a dreamer or a doer? Would you rather keep that perfect thought in your head where it can never be shared but also never be ruined? Or are you prepared to make the world rise up as one and say, meh? I know which one I am, and I can't wait to hear your mez. Happy Halloween, everyone. Thanksgiving's coming up. Hope you're hungry. The 2000 Pound Goldfish by Betsy Beers is available to purchase in e-reader format from Amazon.com for your iPad, Kindle, Mac, or PC. Oh, and uh, regarding Infuriatio F Punch Magnet, is it a daydream of mine? This is something I made up for the video. He's not going to be a recurring character or anything. And he's, of course he's not a recurring painful memory of a admittedly naive childhood dream that I nurtured for I don't know how long before finally seeing it maliciously crushed before my very eyes.